Hello and welcome to Research Radio, a podcast of the Economic and Political Weekly. I'm Johan and today we have with us Professor Sunil Mani for part two of a two-part episode on COVID-19 vaccine R&D and manufacturing in the US and in India. Professor Mani is Director and Professor, RBI Chair at the Centre for Development Studies, Thiruvananthapuram. If you haven't listened to it already, do listen to part one of this episode where we look at the differences in approach adopted by the US and by India and the role of each respective government in promoting R&D and manufacturing. In today's episode, we will discuss how intellectual property laws can facilitate or hinder the development and production of vaccines and the delicate balance of public-private partnership that is needed especially in the field of knowledge production and healthcare. Welcome once again, Professor Mani. Let us begin today's episode with the interesting story of how COVID-19 vaccines came to be produced at such an incredible speed. How was this possible? And do you attribute at least some of the success to public-private partnership? Or do you think it may have been more efficient with either one or the other at the reins? Yeah, the short answer to your question is that it it is certainly due to private-public uh, partnership that this was developed in such a short period of time. So let me explain how, uh, uh, when you use the term short period of time, you know, one needs uh, some explanation for this, for the simple reason that vaccines take hundreds of years to develop, okay? So if you look at the history of vaccine development in the world, uh, uh, there is a very nice paper in the science magazine about this. And uh, so, but if you look at, for instance, uh, tubercle- uh, typhoid fever, the vaccine has taken almost like hundreds, hundred years. Uh, when I say hundred years, the time when the pathogen which is linked to the disease was discovered and, and when the vaccine uh, was given some regulatory authorization, you know, mm-hmm. so that, is inter- that is a time period that was hundred years. Okay. Mm-hmm. And uh, the shortest time span is for measles, which is about 20 years. Now, in the case of COVID-19, the pathogen which was linked to the disease, which is uh, SARS-CoV-2 for, uh, uh, you know, is the pathogen, which is uh, linked to COVID-19, was discovered on 11th of January, 2020. Mm-hmm. And the first vaccine was, the, uh, was uh, an emergency user authorization was given. Uh, uh, by the US FDA uh, in the month of uh, December 2020. So we are talking about uh, something like 11 months when for most other vaccines it has taken so many years. Okay, so that so this is brings us to some very interesting questions about how did this happen, you know. And also we know that uh, uh, now it is almost like two years since these vaccines have been developed and made available. Uh, we all know that uh, the total number of vaccines which are available in the whole world for COVID-19 is only about eight, something like something like eight vaccines, you know. And of course, they are completely overshadowed by these vaccines which have come from the US uh, b- b- by both uh, Pfizer and BioNTech, which is a German company, of course, and, uh, and then Moderna. Uh, and these vaccines are being developed through an altogether completely innovative platform called messenger RNA. Okay, mm-hmm. this was a, a totally new way of making vaccines, which has never been tried before at all. And uh, and the interesting thing about this messenger RNA vaccines is that first of all, for you and me, it is a very highly effective vaccine. We are talking in terms of ninety five percent effectiveness. The side effects are there, there uh, but these are very minor. You know, for instance, uh, in the case of the Pfizer vaccine, there is uh, people have noted noticed uh, something called uh, myocarditis and pericarditis, which is a kind of an inflammation of the heart. But this has been observed only in a very small number of people, and this kind of uh, uh, inflammation can happen even without vaccines. So uh, you know, in, uh, so. Um, uh, there's nothing, and this can be treated and uh, uh, taken care of. Okay, so very safe and effective vaccine was developed in a matter of 11 months. So it begs the question, uh, how is that, you know, such a complex disease like uh, SARS-CoV-2, we were able to do the uh, the COVID-19, we were able to do this in such a short period of time. Okay, Mm -hmm. 
Now, uh, the first thing is that uh, the United States has one of the best uh, health research system in the world. They have a large number of institutions, public institutions, which are related to uh, health research. And this is very surprising because here is a country where government intervention is considered to be a dirty word. Okay. And almost everything is uh, uh, provided by the private sector. Most of the world's biggest multinational companies are from the US. And, uh, uh, and in fact, you, you have seen the previous president was also coming from a private sector com company <laughs> and, and, and so on. So the private sector and markets are, uh, you know, and uh, the, the US was, uh, US institutions and thinking was very much behind economic liberalization. Which, uh, which was introduced into many emerging economies uh, at the beginning of the 1990s. So here is a country where the private sector is given paramount importance or commanding heights, if we use our own language. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, but it has, in the area of uh, health research, uh, it has a large number of public institutions and instruments for supporting research by private sector. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things that the U.S. has been doing has been promoting basic research in uh, vaccine research over a very long period of time. Okay, So they have the National Institutes of Health uh, with a number of uh, uh, specialized laboratories within the National Institutes of Health, which has been working on uh, vaccine research. They have also been, the federal government has also been funding research on vaccines in uh, medical schools uh, within the U.S. Uh, and for instance, one of the medical schools was which, which was actively involved in developing mRNA vaccine, messenger RNA vaccines, uh, is the University of Pennsylvania. Okay, the, the medical school there, and specifically, uh, there were two scientists there, uh, uh, and uh, who were involved in uh, you know this, this vaccine research and this. Uh, uh, was going on from about the late 1990s. Okay, so uh, and uh, so now, why mRNA vaccines? Why is it so uh, innovative? And first, the, it is very easy to design. Okay, so uh, so when you have a a, a, a disease like SARS-CoV-2, which uh, I'm sorry, I, I'm always uh, confusing. I'm sorry. Uh, it is when a disease like COVID-19, which uh, uh, spread so quickly uh, to almost the whole world, you know. So you cannot wait for, uh, uh, you know, just some 20 years to develop a vaccine, okay. So you have to go in for that particular technology which would allow you to develop a vaccine very quickly, okay. Mm -hmm. So that's the first one, okay, quick to design. Second one is that it's easily scalable. You can make bil millions of doses of this vaccine also very quickly. Now, both these were very much required in the context of COVID-19 because COVID-19 was spreading like anything. It was holding the whole world into kind of a standstill. And so you had to develop a vaccine very quickly. And also you required large numbers of doses of those vaccine because almost the whole world had to be vaccinated. You know, And so the mRNA platform became very, very helpful for that one. And this basic research on mRNA vaccines were going on and uh, you know in number of uh, uh, national institutes of health as well as uh, the, uh, the, uh, the University of Pennsylvania and I must say there are two specific technologies that uh, uh, was being tried out and, uh, uh, and and these two specific technologies one was uh, the viral protein which was designed by a scientist called Dr. Barney Graham and his colleagues and uh, he's, at, he's at the Chief Viral Pathogenesis Laboratory, which is part of the National Institutes for Allergy and Infectious Disease, you know, whose head was uh, Dr. Fauci, who became a kind of a, you know, a, a, a face of the U U.S. vaccine uh, research. Mm -hmm. okay. And so Dr. Dr. Barney Graham, uh, uh, you know, designed this viral protein. In fact, uh, what is most interesting is that uh, uh, a few years ago, Dr. Barney Graham was even working on a vaccine for Nipah virus. Nipah is another communicable disease, which is extremely dangerous. 
uh, and uh, which uh, uh, you know was noticed in the northern part of Kerala uh, about a few years ago, and uh, and a few people. Luckily, it was contained very quickly. You know, it doesn't spread as quickly as uh, uh, COVID nineteen, but it is more uh, fatal than COVID nineteen. Okay, mm -hmm. but it was uh, very quickly uh, you know dealt with, and uh, by the the Kerala. Department of Health, you know, and, and given the fact that the public health system in Kerala is good. Anyway, uh, Dr. Barney Graham was working on even Nipah virus, you know, a vaccine for Nipah virus. So uh, this viral protein designed by him became very useful for uh, uh, developing this COVID-19 vaccine. The second is the concept of RNA modification. And this was first developed by a scientist called Drew, uh, Drew Weisman. And, uh, and another professor called Professor Catalin Carrico. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, these two professors, Professor Weissman and uh, uh, Professor Carrico, were at the University of Pennsylvania. So, uh, so this basic research was going on. So, when SARS CoV 1 came in the early 2000s, they started experimenting a vaccine for SARS CoV 1. Okay. Mm -hmm. Then came the Middle East Respiratory Syn Syndrome or MERS. In two, around 2013, so they started. These are all coronaviruses, okay. okay. And our, uh, the SARS-CoV-2 is the new coronavirus, okay. okay. And, and uh, so they have already been working on this, and so they started tweaking this for the new virus that came on stream. So the basic point that I wish to make here is that here is a country where uh, private sector was given the commanding heights of the economy. But in terms of health research and knowledge production, especially in high technology, not only just in health research, but all areas of high technology, the government and the federal, the federal government and its institutions played a very important role. Okay, And basic research was simply not neglected at all. Instead, it was very vastly encouraged. Now, as a footnote item, you may ask the question, then how is that this company called BioNTech, which is a German company, how did that manage to do this because uh, I've been talking only about the US and how did these Germans get into the whole thing. Now, the most interesting thing is that in 2014, this Professor Catalin Carrico moved to BioNTech. Okay, and she joined BioNTech uh, in 2014 as their chief technical officer. Okay, something equivalent to that. It may not be exactly the same designation, but something similar to that one. So her presence there so she carried with her the uh, the, the knowledge that she was she had developed while she was working on this uh, uh, you know concept of RNA modification project in the mm -hmm. in, in the University of Pennsylvania, okay, and beyond uh, then uh, was able to quickly develop thanks to the presence of uh, uh, Professor Catalin Carrico there. She's a Hungarian American econo uh, you know uh, American uh, doctor. Okay. And uh, uh, so her presence actually made the difference for BioNTech. Now they joined with Pfizer because Pfizer in vaccine, the most important thing is this different phases of research, uh, you know, testing. You know, you have phase one trial where when you actually try with a small number of subjects for the safety uh, of the vaccine and, and it's of course effectiveness. Then in phase two, you do the same thing for a larger number of subjects. And in phase three, you do even a larger number. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, the thing about uh, uh, SARS-CoV-2 uh, uh, is that you had to do this quickly. So that they were doing this simultaneously. Now, there is only one company in the world which has actually optimized how to do this in a very effective way, and that is Pfizer. So, uh, so BioNTech got... Uh, uh, you know, joined with Pfizer, and uh, and, uh, and 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 this uh, uh, you know vaccine was born. You know, by uh, in fact, as uh, I am told that they, they even developed this as early as May two thousand twenty. Okay, mm -hmm. and then of course these tests were going on, and then finally the U.S. FDA gave the emergency user authorization by December. Okay. I see. So uh, the, the, the long answer to your question is that now uh, basic research in vaccines should be, should be encouraged. And, uh, and 
Now, this is difficult to be encouraged because the, it is very complex technology. Okay. Second is, uh, it is uh, the failure rates are extremely high because many of these basic research may not lead to anything, uh, you know, uh, commercializable in, in, in the future. Okay. Mm-hmm. And, and it costs a lot because it, uh, you know, and it costs a lot of money. Okay. So when you have these three things put together, complexity of the, uh, the technology, the high failure rates in the, uh, in, in the R&D project, and the very high investments which are required, you do require, a, you know, it's only the government which can actually do. Okay. Mm-hmm. It's the private sector will not do this kind of research. Only the government can do. And, and that's precisely what the Americans have done. And that's what precisely what the Europeans have not done. And uh, so that's why the European, you know, you have only the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine. And that got in because Oxford University was doing similar kind of research in these areas. So uh, AstraZeneca joined with Oxford University to do that. Okay. And, uh, and there also you can see that uh, uh, they received a lot, fair amount of support from the UK government for doing that. And also... Uh, the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine was also financially supported by the U.S. Uh, uh, Operation Bob Speed. Okay, so the uh, uh, you know so they were able to do that because they never neglected basic research in vaccine. Uh, you know, so that was going on for years, and so when these new uh, you know diseases came on stream, they could tweak it to that particular thing so quickly. I'd like to go back to something that you mentioned earlier and something that you also mentioned in your paper, and that is that it is hard for R&D to happen in a free market economy because even with instruments like patents, profit-seeking companies often reduce their investment in R&D. At the same time, it seems that when the government intervenes, it is the private sector that benefits from public investment. Yeah. Would you like to comment on this? Yeah, this is a very old uh, result which the famous uh, uh, Nobel Prize win- uh, winning uh, uh, economist uh, Professor Arrow, Kenneth Arrow, has said uh, in the 1962 in, a, in an interesting paper. Okay, Now, what is being said is that when you talk about knowledge production uh, uh, and if you leave that activity entirely to the private sector, there can be under investments in R&D. Now, why should underinvestments happen? Is it happens essentially because knowledge is a public good. Okay, you cannot exclude another person from uh, uh, consuming that. Okay, and it's also non-rivalrous in the sense that your consumption of a public good does not reduce the, that's uh, that is available for another person because of the public good nature of knowledge. If that is led to the private sector they will under-invest, under-invest, okay? Mm-hmm. Now, let me give you an example. Let's say uh, you do an r and and come out with a new drug for treating a particular disease, mm-hmm. okay? Within a short period of time, despite patent protection, etc., the knowledge will leak from that company to other companies, and they will also come out maybe with an improved product, Okay, mm-hmm. and this improved product is then introduced in the market. So the original company's monopoly position is now effectively challenged. Mm-hmm. Okay, so that challenge will manifest itself in the form of the original company having a reduced rate of profit. Okay, but at the same time, the society benefits from this. So the societal benefits will be much higher. Okay, so for any kind of technology, then you can define two kinds of rates of return. One is the rate of return to the specific company which has originally developed that technology. And second is the societal rate of return because of increased competition, uh, the, the price of that product comes down, more people are able to afford it uh, and, and so on. So you have two rates of return. Okay, And it has been it theoretically shown, then of course they are also uh, uh, empirically verified that the societal rate of return for most technologies are much higher than uh, private rates of return. Mm-hmm. Okay, so if that is the case, then why should I spend money and develop something where somebody else is going to also benefit? Mm-hmm. Okay, 
Now, even private sector individuals, so it's like when I write a paper and, uh, you know, somebody else copies the same paper and then, you know, uh, I publish it somewhere, you know, I, I'll be unhappy and my desire to uh, do research, then I can become a, like a cynic, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, why should I do research? You know, you know, it's only going to be copied by someone else. And, and uh, so my desire to do research will go down. Similarly, companies also have that kind of an underinvestment possibility. And this has been demonstrated. So when the societal rate of return is higher than the private rate of return, the idea of uh, government, the governments have left to step in to make and give the private sector firm a kind of a subsidy. So that subsidy, the quantity of subsidy that you give is the different is the amount that would raise the private rate of return as close as possible to the societal rate of return. Okay, so that they don't have any desire to underinvestment, underinvest in. R &D. Hmm. So because of this, I think in knowledge production, this is this is what I've been telling right from the beginning. Hmm. You can't leave this activity to the private sector. Okay. Hmm. It has to be done by the government. And in fact, if you look at the history of technology development, you know, in, in the world, all major technologies now, uh, which we now take it for granted, for instance, the internet. Okay. Hmm. Who developed it? It's not developed by the private sector is developed by the government uh, uh, and then subsequently given to the private sector to and they made improvements in it etc and so on and various uh, uh, new kinds of using using that particular technology okay mm -hmm. microwave oven is another uh, product which we all use on a uh, uh, you know regular basis but these are all come from substantial input from government okay so i think uh, the uh, uh, you know the uh, you have to provide support for R&D activities by the government. And this support can manifest itself in various formats. Okay, In the case of vaccine research, I think the format that is most acceptable is the advanced marketing commitment, the AMC that I talked about. Mm -hmm. But Professor Mani, when we talk about the public good aspect of knowledge, we run up against the issue of intellectual property rights. For many yeah. years now, India has arguably been at the forefront of a very progressive attitude to intellectual yeah. property in the pharmaceutical sector, from CIPLA's AIDS drugs in Africa to the Gleevec case on evergreening of patents, and yeah. including India's lobbying at the WTO recently for patent waivers on COVID-19 vaccines, diagnostics and treatments. To what extent has intellectual property then been a hurdle to vaccine production? And will patent waivers be enough to fill the knowledge gap on the production side? Because as you rightly point out in your paper, unlike therapeutics, vaccines are not so easy to reverse engineer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think uh, uh, for any kind of knowledge production, patents or intellectual property rights are very important because that's the way you incentivize that activity. You provide a kind of a temporary monopoly position to uh, the, the firm which has developed this technology so that at least for a certain period of length, no one else gets into the, uh, that area. Okay. Now, in the case of vaccine research, patent waivers have been sought. For instance, India along with South Africa had sought patent waivers. Now, the, uh, and this has not been given so far. So far, it's not been given, you know, and uh, uh, which is, of course, strange because uh, when a request such as this is made, the WTO needs to act upon it immediately. But there's been very strong opposition to this from all uh, Western European countries, uh, Norway, Japan, etc. You know, uh, along with European Union, uh, Norway and Japan also joined uh, in, in uh, uh, raising calculus against this uh, uh, patent waiver policy. Okay. Now, the point is, uh, what I understand is that Vaccines, put in simple terms, are large molecules, whereas therapeutic drugs are small molecules. Now, in small molecules, reverse engineering is possible. So if you have a patent waiver, then it is possible for companies in India to take the uh, uh, drug, which is developed by the innovator company, okay, rip it apart, understand its molecular structure, and then put it back in a in a better way, in a, a much more cost effective way. You know that's what our generic drug manufacturers have done. Okay, but that 
kind of uh, uh, reverse engineering apparently is not possible in the case of vaccines because they are large molecules are much more complex. So those reverse engineering possibilities are limited. Okay, that's the first point. Now that whether this is correct or not, as an economist, I won't be able to make any uh, comments. Okay, so that's why they said that patent waiver alone will not be helpful. Patent waiver plus a technology transfer uh, is what we require. Okay, that of course the uh, uh, multinationals will not be interested at all. Okay, now one dark side of the American story, which I have not said, is that I said the U.S. government has given some twenty-six billion dollars to them, and they have also done a, quite a lot of basic research, which these which have been li then licensed to these companies. Now, these companies have quickly taken patents on all these products and claiming that it is their own. For instance, uh, uh, for instance, uh, Pfizer itself, through its uh, various as associated companies, have uh, taken a large number of patents on different aspects of uh, uh, this, this COVID-19 vaccine. Uh, vaccine okay? uh, and likewise, Moderna has also uh, done, uh, uh, you know, taken several uh, uh, patents. And uh, as a result, now a kind of a patent war of sorts is taking place between the federal government and these companies. Mm -hmm. Okay, and uh, so unless a uh, you know the patent waiver plus a technology transfer and technology transfer, these companies are not willing to give because uh, they want to be monopolies because they have made a huge profit. Okay, so if you look at Pfizer's balance sheet now, it is far more. Uh, you know, they, they have become very, very rich. In fact, uh, uh, because of this COVID-19 vaccines, mm -hmm. they have become very extremely rich. So they are not going to be interested at all. They are not altruistic at all. You know, and uh, so they have, uh, they are willing to have some limited, uh, you know, uh, just to keep you quiet, give a, a, some small doses of, it's like throwing an occasional sandwich when you, when a child cries, you throw an occasional sandwich. So just to keep you, or a lollipop, you know, so that, uh, you know, to, to keep you quiet. So I'm willing to do that kind of thing in, uh, you know, in, in emerging economies. So, uh, so then the next possibility is compulsory licensing. Okay. You, you can invoke a, like you refer to the, some of the early cases here where we had actually given a compulsory license. Okay. Only one compulsory license have been given by government of India. Was it for the swine flu? Uh, no, it was for a cancer. Uh, it was for a cancer, cancer. Uh, I think kidney cancer, cancer of the I kidney. Mm -hmm. Okay, and a drug which can treat the, uh, you know, and it was given to a Hyderabad-based company, one compulsory license. Okay, that is the that is the only thing uh, we have not used compulsory licensing that much in India. Okay, only mm -hmm. now why? Because when people talk about compulsory licensing, they are under the impression that. Pfizer and Moderna will license a forced uh, to provide a license to Serum Institute or some other company. Okay, that's not the way compulsory license works. Mm -hmm. Serum Institute or any other domestic manufacturer will have to develop that technology on their own of the Pfizer Moderna, uh, you know, mRNA vaccine. So that vaccine is patented. That is, there is a product patent for that vaccine. That vaccine can be made by, legally made by these people under a compulsory license. But the technology for making that, these companies will have to develop it on their own. Mm -hmm. And they also will have to pay a royalty rate to the, uh, to the, uh, the, 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 the rate will be determined by the government but, uh, and to the uh, uh, manufacturer. Okay. But since these are large molecules, for them to develop a, in a cost effective way, the same vaccine uh, in India is not possible or is very difficult. Okay. Mm -hmm. So a compulsory license possibility is also not uh, a, on the cards. So the only car, uh, only possibility is a patent waiver plus a te technology license, uh, you know, a, a liberalization of the licensing. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that is the, now in the case of Oxford AstraZeneca, that's what has happened. Serum Institute is making Covishield, which is the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine. 
based on a license which are voluntarily given by Oxford uh, AstraZeneca to uh, AstraZeneca to Serum Institute. So it's a voluntary licensing. Okay. And, but we don't know the conditions under which that license has been contracted. We have no idea about the conditions under which that license has been conducted because that's uh, not revealed. Okay. okay. Second is that we also know that Serum Institute is not sub-licensing that technology to anyone else. Okay. COVID Shield is made only in Serum Institute and not in any other company. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. So, uh, you know, so for instance, a lot of people said we should allow this public sector laboratories, etc., to make vaccines. But who will give the license? Mm -hmm. Where will they get the technology to make those? Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, the only technology that we have, which where government could put some pressure, was this co vaccine uh, technology, which was Bharat Biotech's thing. Because Bharat Biotech had received some support from the ICMR, etc., to develop that. So they can be made to license that to to others you know uh, but even that has doesn't seem to have happened okay that doesn't seem to have happened so there's not been any sub licensing that i remember okay mm -hmm. so that is the story on uh, iprs uh, you you need to have a patent waiver plus a technology transfer mm -hmm. okay mm -hmm. only then it will make sense Compulsory licensing doesn't make any sense. And in any case, in India, we have only one instance of a compulsory license. I see. Yeah. So to continue on this question of intellectual property, there has been a lot of discussion, not only with, with regard to pharmaceuticals and vaccines, but even more generally about who should benefit from research that is publicly funded. Because some would argue that if the money is coming from government coffers, the knowledge so produced should be public. Yeah, yeah. Now, that is, a, uh, the, uh, that is an important point. In fact, that's what I refer to as the patent war, which is now taking place in the US. Because a lot of this money, a uh, lot of the research underlying this vaccine was developed by federal agencies. But now the private companies are making profit out of it. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, so I think that kind of a sharing, I, you know, you need to have some kind of a, a agreed formula for. Uh, uh, doing this. The US, they have something called a Baydol Act, uh, okay, which allows you to make some kind of a sharing of uh, publicly funded research, uh, you know, with others uh, and with the federal government, etc. and so on. But we, we did not have anything equivalent to that here. Some, mm -hmm. uh, some time ago, uh, there was a, a bill was uh, placed in the parliament, but it was not uh, passed or anything and it has sort of withdrawn. Okay, because for the simple reason that our public laboratories are not developing that much of technologies which are then licensed. We don't have uh, very many cases. We have specific cases of uh, technology development, but we don't have uh, very many cases of such things, you know. But I think your argument is valid in the sense that if uh, public money has been put in uh, into the hands of private sector, then they need to uh, share that with everyone else, okay. Mm -hmm. And rather than keeping it to yourself. So, but we need to have a, a legal, uh, uh, the, the legal underpinnings for doing that needs to be crafted. Mm -hmm. That brings me to my final question, Professor Mani. Yeah. At a policy level, you say it seems that India's approach was to focus more on distribution, almost expecting the private sector to sort out the R&D and manufacturing side of things on their own. Whereas in the US, with all the talk of free markets, the government intervened very strongly. What does this experience say about the reliance on free markets? Would it be fair to say that it makes the case for greater government intervention, especially in sectors like knowledge production and healthcare? Yeah, uh, uh, my uh, uh, position is that based on whatever I have seen uh, happening in other countries uh, and also in our own country, is that I think uh, it is very important for governments to intervene in the markets for knowledge production. Okay, but this intervention does not necessarily mean government itself doing the R and D. Okay, mm -hmm. the R and D can be done by the private sector, uh, and the government can finance a part of it, and you can also have some agreed way of sharing the output whenever it's developed. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, uh, uh, and this is because 
unless the locus of research and manufacturing happens in the same agent, converting the research results, in, supposing let's take the counterfactual position of government doing all the research and the manufacturing being done by uh, private sector firms, okay? Mm -hmm. Then you have this eternal conversation on building a bridge between the government and the private sector firms. And there are very few areas where this bridge has been neatly built. In our country, as far as I know, uh, this has been very neat. Uh, uh, there are only, uh, if you take the CSIR network of laboratories, uh, you know, one laboratory which has got a very, relatively speaking, very good experience of li licensing its technology to the local industry is a National Chemical Laboratory in Pune. You know, mm -hmm. It is considered to be one of the best uh, in, in, in that area. Okay. But that's very, very specific and, in a, you know, for historical reasons, etc. Because Indians are terribly good in the area of chemical research. That is one of the most important areas of uh, uh, our capability. Okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, so uh, wherever you find uh, or science-based industries, science-based industries, we are, uh, seems to be very good. So, uh, uh, you know, a better performance of us in science-based industries may not be generalized. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the point is, I think uh, uh, the, the private sector should do both research and manufacturing because the probability of converting the output of that research is higher when they do it because they have a, a market incentive to convert the research results into something commercializable down the line. Okay, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But given the market failure issues involved in knowledge production that I talked about earlier. You know, private sector will not take up R&D projects in certain areas. So the government will have to nudge, nudge them to do so. Okay. And that nudging is done essentially through uh, pro provision of various kinds of subsidies. Okay. And the resultant profit, if they make, you can have a, a contract for sharing that with the government. Okay. Mm -hmm. Or, uh, you know, making this available at uh, a cheaper rate so that people, uh, you know, the population at large will benefit also from that research. So I think we need to have some good conversations on this uh, matter to arrive at something which is very optimal. But our conversations always get skewed with either government or private sector. It's not either or, it's both. Mm -hmm. Okay. And in fact, if you look at... Uh, the experience of uh, other industries where we have done well, you know, and I would just give you the example of uh, computer software. Okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's basically, it, it is a, a, an excellent example of both government and the private sector working together. Although some uh, economists have referred to this success as benign neglect of the government, etc. and so on. But what you find is that uh, there is a fair amount of government intervention because the key factor input which is used in that research, in that industry is basically software engineers. And most of the software engineers have come from publicly funded institutions, you know. And uh, of course, you, you have a few private sector things which have come up quite recently of varying quality, etc. But most of them have come from public sector institutions. And they have been at the mainstay of that particular industry. Okay. So I think it is both government and the private sector working together and this is what has happened in the US, okay? Although they outwardly will go around saying market is, uh, you know, is superior, consumer is king, you know, uh, commanding heights of the economy, etc. should be private sector, etc. But uh, in knowledge production, they are always willing to have a, a government intervention, okay? Mm -hmm. For instance, now for uh, semiconductor uh, de technology development, uh, the U.S. is again going to have some kind of a big public sector projects. Okay, uh, the government is putting a lot of money to, uh, you know, to develop semiconductors, uh, to finance semiconductor research. But its ultimate benefic beneficiaries will be private sector companies. Okay, and, and because what they look at is the nation should benefit, uh, you know, uh, from the whole activity. You know, because if you are going to make more semiconductor, because uh, uh, you know, digital products are extremely going to be important in the future. Okay, so components for digital products are going to be very important. And uh, the so if you have a, a, a you know a capable tremendous if you build capability in that area, I know that's go good for the nation. 
you know so so they we should think from that point of view i believe okay in that process it is quite possible that some specific agents may also benefit okay and uh, but then you can have uh, uh, some ways of uh, you know say for instance cloying in that profits you can cloy in that profits uh, uh, you know through through some income sharing means thank you professor mani those are all my questions for today thank you so much for having me on the show and it was really a pleasure to discuss with you on this important issue the pleasure was mine thank you once again and thank you to our listeners for joining us you can find the papers mentioned in today's episode in the show notes and for more episodes of research radio head to epw.in/podcasts to experience all that epw has to offer head to epw.in and subscribe today This is Johan saying bye-bye and see you next time on Research Radio.